Good evening, and welcome to the National Museum of the United States Air Force. At this time, I would like to introduce Mr. Wes Henry, Chief of the Research Division. Thank you, Don. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the National Museum of the United States Air Force and the museum's director, Major General Retired Charles D. Metcalf, welcome to the museum's first Wings and Things guest lecture series program of 2010. Thank you all for braving the cold to attend tonight's presentation. I'm sure you'll find it very useful. Our speaker tonight is the Honorable Greg During, former Assistant Secretary of the Air Force for Manpower and Reserve Affairs. The Secretary's topic tonight concerns his participation in the classified Raven Forward Air Controller Program in Laos during the war in Southeast Asia. Secretary During entered the Air Force in December 1967 and completed undergraduate pilot training in early 1969. His first assignment was in the 01 Bird Dog as a forward air controller for the 25th Army of the Republic of Vietnam. In April 1970, he transferred to the secret Raven program in Laos flying both the 01 and the AT-28. Following a long and distinguished career, Secretary During retired from the Air Force as a colonel in January 1996. He had accumulated over 4,400 flying hours, including 1,525 combat hours and over 800 combat, combat sorties. His awards and decorations include the Silver Star, the Defense Superior Service Medal, the Distinguished Flying Cross with one oak leaf cluster, the Air Medal with 26 oak leaf clusters, and numerous other awards. In 1988, he was presented the Lance P. C. John Award, the highest individual award for leadership in the senior officer category. Secretary During continue, continued to serve his country after his Air Force retirement by being appointed the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Reserve Affairs in July 2001, then later as Assistant Secretary of Defense for Reserve Affairs. In 2007, the President appointed him to the position of Assistant Secretary of the Air Force for Manpower and Reserve Affairs, and he held, and he held that position until his retirement in April 2009. The museum is honored to have Secretary During here with us tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Secretary During. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, you know, I tell folks, don't get, uh, you know, don't pay for your meal before you've had a chance to taste it. Because, you know, <laughs> it may be good, it may, may be not so good. Is, uh, is this working fine? You get a voice? Okay, well, we got that square filled at least. Thank you very much for the nice introduction. Thank you, General Metcalf, for, the, for inviting me to be here with you tonight. It's uh, been a great visit going around the museum. Uh, I have to tell you a little bit before we get started, First off, I, I used this just because it was convenient. And it's, of course, the, the, uh, the cover of the book, The Ravens, and I know they're selling them out here in the bookstore. There's actually only about four more boxes of those things left in existence. <laughs> uh, not here. They're not actually not here. Once these run out, they're uh, But uh, the website, theravens.org, if you don't get one tonight, you, you can get one there for as long as they last. We're not going to reprint them. So it's been a few years they've been out. What I want to do tonight is uh, tell you in the short period of time that we have about the Raven program from my perspective. The problem is, of course, I can't tell you like a historical perspective because I haven't done the, you know, the study. I'm pretty familiar with it. But I can only give you my portion of it. And perhaps by doing so, you can gain an appreciation for what was happening around us. Think of it as, as a layer cake. And you're going to cut a slice out of the layer cake, and the layers appear there. And so you're going to get a taste of everything. Program started in 1996 um, and lasted for about six years. And it uh, involved about 190 people total. About 172, we think, actually flew with the Raven call sign in combat. Uh, so a very small program, covered a very large period uh, of time, a uh, short period of time over a very large country. And I'm going to just tell you my story, and uh, we'll go from there. I'm going to cover about two-thirds of the, the presentation, stop, and we'll take some uh, questions. And I'll watch the time, and I'll get you out of here on time. 
tonight. What? I thought I'd get applause for No, I'm sorry. <laughs> we'll see what happens. Okay. Let's see. Now, you've got to love a picture like that. I mean, how can... <laughs> And with a picture like that, you've got nowhere to go but up, right? I think later on what we'll do is we'll have a caption contest, and you're, willing, you're ready to submit your suggestions. I thought maybe, no, Mom, I did not steal that chicken. <laughs> Actually, I was born and raised in Mankato, Minnesota, which is a town of about 35,000 people in the midst of the famous Valley of the Jolly Green Giant. My ancestors were among the first settlers of southwest Minnesota and fought in the Sioux Uprising of 1862, Civil War, and all wars since. When I was about 12 years old, I took my first flight in an airplane, penny a pound, out at the local airport. Yeah, I climb into an airplane with a bunch of strangers, and that one flight around the pattern there for, I think, like a dollar and 20 cents, uh, convinced me that I wanted to fly airplanes, and I never varied from that again. And when I went to uh, high school right there in town, uh, Loyola High School, and joined the Civil Air Patrol, the cadet program, and worked my way through the ranks and eventually became the senior ranking cadet in the Minnesota wing before actually converting to become a senior member. I attended Man Mankato State College in my hometown since I couldn't afford any other option. We had no ROTC back in the 60s, so Air Force OTS became my goal. College was difficult. And the draft was a constant threat to my plans. But because I had to work my way through school, it took four and a half years to complete my studies, which required a six-month extension from the local draft board, something kids don't worry about these days. I'm glad I grew up before the days of big government, when I was still able to put on a suit and a tie and present my own argument in person to members of my own community. I think we've lost something over the years. Graduated from college just before Christmas, 1967, and immediately drove to San Antonio to spend New Year's Eve in a motel room waiting for my OTS class to start. Following commission, I drove to Craig Air Force Base in Alabama in April 1968 to begin pilot training in class 6906. I heard all the jokes you can imagine about being named after the base or having the base named after me, but the worst part was seeing the trash cans all over the base that were stenciled, help keep Craig clean. When I went, went back to Craig uh, a couple of years later as an instructor pilot, during my in-processing of the base dental clinic, a young technician uh, kind of topped them all when he simply picked up my records, looked at my name, and said, mm, 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 mm. that's a damn good thing your folks didn't name you Goose Bay. <laughs> so, flew uh, T-41s, tubed an instrument check ride in T-37s. Uh, those are the days before we had DME and magic things like that doing an instrument approach, uh, but that reduced me down to the middle of the pack, so I knew fighters were out of the question when it came time to graduate. Well, that was fine because I had a, an instructor in class that had shown us a picture of himself dressed as a, as a FAC, forward air controller, and I said, that looks like a pretty cool, pretty cool deal. So when our class came, our list came down, we had one OV-10, two O2s, and three O1s. Now, I wanted to improve my odds. So I got together with some of my buddies that wanted to be facts. We started a whispering campaign that said that uh, the facts were suffering extremely high loss rates over there. And so what we did is we scared not the guys, but the wives, the, the married guys, who said, you don't take one of those things. You take it. You take a nice, safe ATC job as an instructor pilot. Yes, ma'am. So the road not taken, you know, as the Robert Frost poem says, and I got an old one and a fast track for Vietnam. I arrived in Vietnam in August 1969, and after completing my in-country checkout at the aptly named Forward Air Controller University at Phan Rang, or simply known as FACU, I moved on <laughs> to the little farming village of Duc Hoa, Vietnam, the home of the 25th Arvin Division, located about halfway between Saigon and the Cambodian border. The Tet Offensive of 1968 had left a lot of scars around the countryside, but activity had slowed down considerably when the NVA and the VCA took time to regroup. Now that they had pulled out, not that they had pulled out, but the level of activity wasn't as great as it had been. Still, I saw some action and even earned a DFC by breaking up an ambush that had been set for a special forces unit operating near the Parrot's Beak in the Angel's Wing. 
We also volunteered to fly blacked out helicopter gunship missions at night, or at least until our boss found out about it. Still, the missions were not as fulfilling as I expected. Another problem was that my boss, who was, was probably the worst leader I'd ever met in my 28 years now of Air Force experience, the longer I remained there, the more convinced I was that my career would never get out of the starting gate. So one day at Benoit, I saw a young man in uh, blue jeans and remarkably long hair with the greatest lamb chop sideburns I'd ever seen. I asked my buddy, who is that? Uh, that's Captain so-and-so. My eyes made the next question superfluous. He's a raven, my buddy continued. I said, what's that? He says, hell, I don't know, but I heard they fly some sort of secret mission somewhere. They all have prices on their heads placed there by the VC. It's pretty dangerous. Well, that was that. I was beginning to recognize epiphanies when I saw them. And I knew I had to become a raven. In short, I, I mean, do mean short, in a short discussion with the stranger, he revealed one useful bit of information. If I wanted a piece of the action, I had to go to the 504th TAC Air Support Group Commander and inter interview with him for what they called Project 404. The appointment was made, and on that morning, I began to walk around the airfield to the distant headquarters of the 504th TAC Air Support Group. We, we didn't have cars, of course. Fortunately, a blue station wagon pulled up, and the driver offered me a ride. As luck would have it, and I had many lucky experiences in Southeast Asia, it was the 504th TAC Air Support Group commander himself. Where are you headed? I said, I was coming to see you. I have an appointment with you to talk about Project 404. We pulled into his reserve parking spot and conducted the interview right there in the big old station wagon. Finally, he said, I'm going to let you go to the, to the program because you come from the Midwest, and I appreciate good mist Midwestern common sense. We need some of that up there. You see, when pilots get away from the flagpole, they tend to change and become loose and unmanageable. His words were like cheap liquor to an alcoholic. <laughs> the more he talked about how undisciplined those facts were, the tougher it was to keep from salivating all over my shirt. <laughs> Once inside the headquarters, I was taken to the intel vault where I was allowed to read a two-page summary of Project 404. I learned that it was in Laos and that the members wore civilian clothes and a few other useful tidbits, but not many details. My instructions were to return to my unit and wait for a message to move. I was on cloud nine. I danced my way back to Duqua and proudly announced to all that I was leaving on the in the very near future, but I couldn't say much more than that. One of my close friends, this is actually a picture of him taken in Laos later on, Park Bunker, he's the guy with the, uh, the gun in his hand uh, in the brown shirt. One close friend and fellow fact was very interested. His name was Captain Park Bunker, an academy graduate, married, and at least 30 years old all of which made him seem at least 20 years older than he was. Paul was exceptionally interested and eventually followed me into the program. And I'll have more to say about him in a few minutes. I went about my duties with my duffel bag standing by my bed, but the, the call never came. Day after day passed, and March became April before I was able to take a bird dog to Benoit for the 100-hour maintenance check. No sooner did I park the airplane than I hiked my way over to the 504th TAC Air Support Group. I went in and sputtered, I'm, I'm Lieutenant Deering, and I've been waiting for word to go to Project 404. What's taking so long? The calm reply was, didn't you get the word? We sent three HF radio messages to your site with no reply. Therefore, we let the number two guy on the list go. I was in shock. But don't worry, you can be the next one to go. When's the next opening? Well, it's a small program, and we don't think there'll be a slot until August. April, August. I said, August, I gasped. That's my D-Rose date. I know, the personnel specialist replied. If you're willing to sign up for a consecutive overseas tour, you'll be eligible to PCS upcountry. I struggled, but only for a moment. What the hell, I said. I might as well extend, I'm not doing much around here. I now know how a fish feels when he jumps on that big, bright, shiny hook. For no sooner did I return to Duqua than the call came to pack my bags and go to Tonsonut Air Base to catch a commercial flight to Bangkok. I was on the road to high adventure. 
So I said goodbye to my Army and Air Force buddies and headed off to my new life. On Friday, April 10, 1970, after one night in real civilization in Bangkok, I boarded the Klong C-130 flight to Udorn in northern Thailand. Once there, we circled the base for at least an hour awaiting clearance to land. Out the side window, I could see fires burning at various spots on the base. Later, I learned that an RF-4C had been shot up over the Chinese road, lost control on final. The pilot shoved the engines into afterburner, and both aircrew members bailed out. The flaming aircraft struck the AFRTN station at change of shift and killed 19 people. It then traveled through two colonel's trailers, took out a newly remodeled but unoccupied wing of a barracks, and ended up in the swimming pool. One of the air crew members landed in the BX parking lot with his, with his ejection seat smashed through the roof of the base theater, and it landed in the front row. I dragged my way to, to the passenger terminal where I was met by an officer attached to DET-1 of the 56th Special Operations Wing. That was our home when we came to Udorn. It was also our unclassified PCS destination. That's what we told our families back home. He asked if I had any civilian clothes in my bag, to which I replied, yes. Then go into the men's room and change and give me your wallet. I handed over my wallet, dragged my duffel bag into the, through the swinging door. When I came out, he said, you will never wear a uniform again until you are back in the States on your final PCS move. And these cards that refer to the military, such as your club card, your checkbook with your rank on it, etc., all have to be removed. As we drove to Det One headquarters, he continued, I'll lock your uniforms in a connex, and these cards and checks will be kept in a safe and intel where you can get at them if you need them. He gave me back my ID card, my Geneva Convention card, and my flight cap. In the event that we were shot down and unable to escape, he explained, we were, attempting, we were, we were to attempt to claim our rights as prisoners of war with our cards and quickly put on our flight caps in an attempt to be captured in uniform and not shot as a spy. By the way, it never worked. No raven who was not able to escape was ever taken alive. The fact, this fact was brought out to me very graphically some months later when my very good friend Park Bunker, who followed me to the raven program, described his own death on the radio as it took place. Another raven who was shot down after I left, who probably died in the crash, had his body stacked on top of the airplane where it was burned in full view of his friends. I spent the, 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 uh, a great night as a guest of my newly found friends at Det One. Their jobs were to instruct Thai, Lao, and Hmong student pilots on how to fly the AT-28. This airplane was the Navy version of the T-28 Trojan with a large engine and a three-bladed prop. It was outfitted with six inboard bomb stations and two wing-mounted 50 cal machine guns. When they weren't instructing, they flew bombing missions into northern Laos. We got to know all of these air commandos and usually saved our best targets for them. Imagine the challenge of teaching a young man to fly in combat when he didn't even know how to drive a car in a language that was foreign to his tonal language. Two days later, I was driven out to Det One where I, was, where I met my first real raven who dumped me into the back seat of a bird dog and off we went across the Mekong, landing at Watai Airport in Vientiane. That is the administrative capital, and still the capital of Laos. There was a small air terminal on the west side of the field, but uh, much of the north and east sides were filled with Air America airplanes. Neat airplanes like C-130s, uh, Pilatus Porters, like this one, C-47s, C-123Ks, Volpars, and bunches of helicopters, UH-1s, UH-64s. It was magic. We taxied off the southeast end of the runway and onto the ramp where the Lao T-28s were parked in neat rows and O-1s were parked individually among sandbag and PSP revetments. We drove down to the American Embassy compound where I met the Chief Raven, Lieutenant Colonel Bob Foster, probably the finest Air Force officer I have ever met. With a change from, what a change from where I had come. I left the worst Air Force officer I've known and sat down with the best. I was nearly in shock. The Kingdom of Laos is divided into five military regions, simply named MR1 
through MR5. In each was a major city that hosted the flying operations of the Royal Lao Air, Lao Air Force, Air America, and the Ravens. The cities were Vientiane, the, the royal capital of Luang Prabang, Pakse, Savannah Cat, and General Vang Pao's guerrilla headquarters at Long Chen. Let me just take a second here and see if I can point some of these out to you. You can see the, uh, the lines here. Here's MR1, Luang Prabang, is, uh, was the capital city there. We were in MR2, Military Region 2. Long Chen was uh, where we worked out of. Vien Chen was uh, MR5. Down here in MR3, they flew out of Savannah Cat and Pax A for what's left, MR4. Twenty-one Ravens were authorized in country, but I never saw quite that many during my 11-month tour. And there was also a very rapid turnover. The concept was that a FAC or a fighter pilot would serve in, in Vietnam for six months of a normal 12-month tour. Then he spent six months as a Raven. The Raven tour was itself split into two three-month tours, one at Long Chin, or Lima 20 alternate, as it's also called, or just plain alternate. So I'm going to use those sometimes interchangeably. Lima 20 alternate is merely the number of the site. Lima meaning Laos. 20 was the cover story of the, the, the base just north of it, and so that they could be obscure, they called it 20 alternate, or just plain alternate. By the way, it was the busiest airport in the world. Nobody knew it. We actually beat Chicago O'Hare Field. We had more takeoffs and landings than they did. One at Long Chin or Lima 20 alternate, and then three months at one of the other sites. The reason for this was simple. About half the Ravens were flying out of Lima 20 alternate at any given time because that was where most of the fighting was taking place. The threat was consistent up there, while at other locations the threat was a little more sporadic. I've been told, because the NVA had been rocketing Lima 20 alternate every night, the Raven station there had moved back to Vientiane to sleep, but flew north every morning, cycling out of Lima 20 alternate all day before returning back south, about a 45-minute flight to Vientiane. This was normal during the dry season, when the NVA could move heavy equipment over the dirt roads and through shallow rivers. During my welcome interview, I prayed that I would be sent to Lima 20 alternate. Finally, uh, Mr. Foster, by the way, the officers were always referred to as Mr. and the enlisted guys called Tom, Joe, what have you. He said, well, Craig, I'm going to send you to Long Chen to work with Vang Pao. I was, felt ready to jump up and cheer. What I want you to do is the best job you possibly can. And if, he continued, in the process, you piss somebody off, you send them to me because 50% of my job is keeping people off your back so you can fight. Thus began the steady growth of deep respect that I developed for this man in the months that I was privileged to work for him. From that point on, I would have done anything for him. And I would have died before I would have let him down. Almost as an afterthought, I asked, um, I was scheduled to come to Laos a couple of weeks ago and didn't, and didn't get the word to move, so another guy was sent and I was told there wouldn't be an opening until August and so on and so forth. And then I was told to hurry up and go. Can you tell me what happened? Mr. Foster took a deep breath and sat back in his chair. Hank Allen, he began, was scheduled to return home a week or so ago. The person who came to replace him then was Dick Elzenka. Dick arrived 10 days ago. As is the custom, the departing fac normally checks out the new guy. So Hank and Dick took off from Vientiane the next morning in a bird dog, and we never heard from them again. We've never been found. It only took a second for what he said to sink in. If I had received the radio message and departed on time, that would have been me in the back seat of that missing airplane. So I replaced the guy who replaced me. That story set the stage for many close calls that were to occur in the months ahead. I met my new family that night, including A.D. Holt, Stan Ersted, Jeff Thompson, Brian Wages, Jim Cross, Mark D. Bolt, and Jim Struzhager was also known as T-shirt because he was habit of flying in a white T-shirt, blue jeans, and, a co and cowboy boots. 
He also had the greatest handlebar mustache I've ever seen, with the possible exception of the one now worn by Sam Elliott. We probably ate a quick dinner before heading downtown for a night of bar hopping. Our little house was crowded, so the new guy got the couch in the front room. On Wednesday, April 15th, 1970, the guys raced through a pre-dawn breakfast and took one of the Jeeps to the airport to take off for a full day popping bad guys. Tom Palmer, a major in the Air Commandos, sat, sat down with me for a minute and explained what my checkout would, would consist of. Now at the airport, I grabbed my shoulder bag of new 1 to 50 scale maps with a 1 to 250 overall navigation chart, a set of uh, dark glasses, my helmet mounted with a boom mic, and hiked out to the back seat of a waiting T-28. We took off and headed up towards the mountains and the famous plain of jars. The others were already out there and putting in airstrikes in the morning sun. Tom showed me the territory, which consisted of mountain after mountain after mountain. Try as I might, I was so lost, I couldn't believe it. After all, I'd never flown in mountains before, and certainly not when people were shooting at me. Tom put in an airstrike or two, and after two hours, we landed at the secret base of Long Chen. The 4,200-foot runway lay hidden among the sharp, karst mountain peaks with houses and huts and ramps all around. The only way to land was to the west, while the only way to take off was to the east. Can you guess which way is east and west in this? <laughs> they, got, they got a unique barrier up there. Once a pilot cleared the runway on takeoff, he sidestepped to the right to allow the other aircraft to land. You landed every single time, as the sharp peak, peaks at the west made a go-around very unlikely. You quick, I quickly noticed the rusting wing of a C-123 that tried to go around quite unsuccessfully, right at the base of that karst peak. We took a short break, met the intel crowd and some of the maintainers, including both Air Force crew chiefs and Air America contract Filipino crew chiefs. Then we climbed into an 01 with me in the front seat and Tom in the back. Now it was my turn to put in some airstrikes, which I did, apparently to Tom's satisfaction. We landed after lunch and hiked up to the Air America hostel for some fried rice before Tom turned me loose on my own. Let me just give you a little orientation here. Oop, gotta hold that down. So you land, this is the Air America ramp. Our ramps were down here. There was a, like a commercial ramp, an overflow was down here. It wasn't used very much. Where we lived was in this little compound right here. Am I in your way? I'm sorry. This area here. These were our houses right here. The CIA guys were on this side of the street. This was the Air America hostel. They had a little, little cafe in there. But we did most of our eating and stuff up there. General Vang Pao's house was a pretty good size house. I think it's right there. Later on, we'll talk about the King's House. It's up here on this ridge. And, um, well, you can kind of get it. We'll, we'll, we'll come back. Okay, uh, we landed after lunch and hiked up to the Air uh, America Hostel for some fried rice before Tom turned me loose on my own. He introduced me to the chief backseater, Captain Yang B, who the guys call General Key because he looked a lot like the South of Vietnamese Air Force Chief of Staff, General Nguyen Cao Ki. The backseaters were soldiers in VP's army who learned English to one degree or another and who often rode with the Ravens to translate the requests of the Hmong officers in the field. Sometimes we flew with them, sometimes we did not. I tended to fly with them very often. Yang Bi was the best and his English was excellent. He was also a very dynamic individual who was very close to General Vang Pao. Tom's specific instructions were to go out and get familiar with the area, but do not direct any airstrikes, especially on the first day in country. Hand them off to the other Ravens. I clearly understood and told him so. We took off. Yang Bi started talking excitedly on his radio in the back seat. After a bit, he called me on the intercom. 27, he said. They couldn't remember our names, so, but they knew our individual call sign. Mine was Raven 27 which told the world I was from Military Region 2. That was, so we were all two something up there. We must go to Lima Site 26, Zengdet. Now, many enemy, many enemy attack right now. A troops in contact situation, or TIC, the highest priority mission was underway. 
Yang B, we can let one of the other ravens handle it. I'm, we're not supposed to direct airstrikes today. No, he replied. No other ravens are airborne. We must go quickly. The fighters will be coming soon. I was up there alone. I checked with the radio operator and found out it was true. That all the other ravens were on the ground, getting refueled, rearmed, or what have you. Nothing else to do but call Cricket, the, the orbiting airborne command and control center, and see what fighters could be sent to me. We arrived overhead of the besieged outpost while Yang Bi kept up a steady stream of unintelligible chatter with his contact below. Soon a flight of A-1 showed up and I directed them to the battalion-sized enemy force which was holed up in a deserted village and at other locations surrounding the Lima site. The A-1s were a great asset because they could stay in the area for hours and carried every kind of ordnance imaginable. The fire was extremely accurate and the enemy moved around quite a bit. When the A-1s were Winchester, i.e. Out, out of ordnance, a second flight of four A-1s came on scene. By this time, the enemy was on the move, so we simply chased them. There was a lot of ground fire reported, but that comes with the territory. They were followed by a flight of two F-105s. Finally, a third flight of four A-1s arrived, and we chased them into the jungle and forced them to break off the attack. The Hmong soldiers were extremely happy and said that between 100 and 200 enemy soldiers had been killed by our airstrikes. I'm not sure if the numbers are accurate, but I earned my second Distinguished Flying Cross on that day, my first day as a Raven. Good grief, I thought. This is going to be one hell of a tour. <laughs> on the evening of the second day, Jerry Ryan, the AOC commander, the guy in the blue there, took me to uh, Vang Pao's house for dinner. Jerry is a remarkable pilot, an air commando from the ground up who was assigned to run the uh, air support mission for General Vang Pao. Jerry was a combat veteran of the A-1 Sky Raider and later in the year he led the A-1s on the famous Sante Raid into North Vietnam. General Vang Pao was a legend throughout Southeast Asia. He was a Hmong, or as we call him in those days, a Mayo. That's the term that we learned. But Mayo is actually a derogatory term given to them by other people who feared them. It means savage. And while we were there, General Vang Pao actually, at a celebration, gave the Hmong people back their original traditional name. So now they're called the Hmong. The, uh, he was the first Hmong to be commissioned in the French Army. And according to Bernard Fall, in his book, Hell in a Very Small Place, Lieutenant Vang Pao was one of only a handful of Laotian officers who performed exceptionally well. In fact, he, he led a company of 300 soldiers during the Battle of Dien Bien Phu in the spring of 1954. He rose to become the only Hmong general in the Laotian army. He was also the leader of his people and led the fight against the communists for years. He had six wives, one from each of the major families of the Hmong. He held the power of life or death, and his decisions for his people were final. But there are many legends surrounding this man, most of which are impossible to prove. But it can be said that at the time, he was at the zenith of his power, and he was smart, dynamic, charismatic, considerate, and still human. I changed into clean clothes, and we drove the very short distance to VP's house in Jerry's Jeep. While the general hosted dinner at his house every night he was in Long Chen, you never really knew who might turn up. So we walked up to the door where VP was talking and waited for him to notice us. Jerry, my friend, welcome to my house, the general began. General Vang Pao, I would like to introduce to you our newest raven, Raven 27. As I had practiced, I joined my hands together at the fingertips to raise them above my eyes in a slight bow, with a slight bow, in the traditional Buddhist sign of showing respect to a higher ranking individual. Simultaneously, VP stuck out his hand to shake mine. We both changed what we were doing, he joining his hands together and I sticking my right hand out once more to coordinate our greetings and finally with a laugh, he grabbed my flailing hand and shook it firmly. Welcome and come inside. I'm going to step through these because uh, it really talks about kind of the, the customs there, the bosses and, the, and the eating habits, but actually we might be just a little short of time if we do that. But this gives you an idea of what the inside of his house was. Very little furniture. We sat on the floor. Usually the dinner was a boiled chicken chopped up just 
right through vegetables, fruit, and the inevitable scotch. Now, it used to be Lao Lao, but somebody turned him on to scotch. And if you had a big party there, there would be uh, the traditional instruments that would be playing. And this is actually one of my guys, up, one of our, my friends upstairs, dancing on the roof because that's where the, the big parties went. We'll skip forward to that. I'll talk to you about it later if you want. The life of a raven was incredibly unstructured. At Lima 20 alternate, we had a raven house, or a hooch as we called it, which was built of all dark wood. There was a large room where we could watch 16 millimeter movies that came in by C-130, along with food and normal supplies. The room had a bar that got plenty of use, although we actually preferred the CIA bar, which was over this bear cage. You just climbed up the right on top. By the way, his name was Floyd. And if you picked up the, uh, the board on the floor, Floyd would stick his snout up there and ask for a drink. He, go, ar, 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 ar. he was an alcoholic. <laughs> and if you poured a beer down or whatever else it was, he would, could get pretty ripped. <laughs> now, Mama Bear lived down there too, as did Baby Bear. When she saw Floyd getting a little you know, flaky, she'd take Baby Bear and push him back into the cave. And then she'd plant herself in front of the cave. And so when Floyd wanted to go back in to lay down, swat across the nose. Nothing changes. I mean, it's all part of its evolution. We had a kitchen, but usually ate our meals with the CIA guys in the dining hall they had, which was run by some excellent Thai cooks. There were bathrooms and with pictures of stick figures posted up there showing how to use a toilet seat. This was necessary because the Hmong who worked for us used our facilities too. Since they were used to squatting on the ground, they often hopped up on the toilet seats before using them. Their weight was too great and the seats inevitably broke. We had a, a radio room in the building, which was, uh, let's see, I think this one here, that's the radio room, which was run by combat controllers from Hurlburt Field. One day, one of our radio operators, who will remain nameless, found an old pistol in the desk drawer. It fascinated him, and he cleared it of ammunition, or so he thought, so he could have a better look. I walked into the radio room just as the gun fired, and a hole appeared in the floor between my feet. We stared at each other in shocked silence for a minute while I did a quick check of my body for unplanned leaks, and, and he started babbling. I thought it was empty. I looked at it first. I've always been around guns all my life. I'm very, very sorry. And he broke down into tears. I didn't even have time to get angry. All's well that ends well. And this was only one of many close calls. The intel room had a, uh, had a room, I should sorry, the intel folks had a room that we stopped at for the latest information. As the months rolled by, I became more cynical of the ability of the intel community to provide much of anything that was timely or useful. Mostly, they were in the receive mode and sent what we learned back to 713th Air Force at Udarn. But they did provide the day's list of fighters on the daily frag, along with their TOTs, their time over target. If we hadn't discussed our plans the night before, we pulled them together at that time, and each man just announced what he was going to do and what fighters he thought he could use. Once we were in the air, we kept in close touch with each other on the FM radios and modified our plans as necessary. We had a ramp full of 01s, six or seven of them, and two AT-28 D-5s for our own use. Now that meant that they had the big engines, of course, and the Dash-5 nomenclature meant that they had the Yankee ejection seats. Everybody wanted to fly the T-28, but you had to wait your turn. When my turn came, I flew to Det-1 at Udorn for a three and a half day, seven ride local checkout to become instrument and range qualified, which meant I could fire rockets and the 50 cal machine guns. Three and a half days. Although we loved having our picture taken in front of the, the Chapacau aircraft, none of us, the Chapacau were the, the, the Hmong or the Lao pilots. This was one of theirs because we liked the bombs because they were cool. None of us was uh, qualified to drop bombs. At another site, while I was in country, an, Air Amer or an American pilot decided to try it anyway and blew himself out of the sky in the process. The two AT-28s were sequentially numbered, oddly enough, 599 and 600. We had had more, but they were shot down. 
I was able to get a, only 250 hours or so on the T-28 before both of ours were shot down and never replaced. Instead, we began to see more U-17s, that's a Cessna 185, move in to take their place. The Bird Dogs flew a three-hour mission while the T-28s were limited to barely two hours. But the Tangos, as we call them, were faster, so they would take off first at dawn to catch the NVA while they were still camouflaging their trucks, or they stayed up late almost till sunset and raced back to the airfield, which was totally unusable at night. The CIA guys, or simply the customer, as we call them, uh, had a hardened blockhouse, an administrative building and billeting. We worked with them all the time. Most of them didn't like to have their pictures taken. This is one exception. Jeff Thompson in the cowboy hat was a raven. And the other guy worked for some federal or agency, I think. <laughs> Father Bouchard, interesting man. We had a church, so I used to, uh, I used on Sundays to go to Mass when Father Bouchard was in the valley. Father B, as he was known, lived out in the jungle with the tribal people of all kinds that would disappear for a couple of weeks and suddenly show up on the flight line or come in over the mountain ridge. He first moved to Laos in 1956 and spoke most of the local dialects. This made him a very valuable source of information uh, to help us learn what was going on in and around the PDJ. Whenever we heard he was in the valley, we knew he would stop by to have a decent meal and to watch a 16 millimeter movie. Now, some of the shows we got from the Air Force were not exactly the kind you would show to a Catholic priest. So we knew that he liked the musical Oliver. And we kept a copy on hand. If the selection was not up to par, we would simply say, gosh, Father, you know, they haven't delivered anything recently. Would you like to see Oliver again? And he'd always agree, and I've seen that silly movie dozens of times <laughs> now. Father Bouchard and I remain good friends, and we have visited each other every year or two since those days. He's now retired in Miami and celebrating his 50th anniversary of ordination with the Oblates of Mary Immaculate this summer. Sometimes I flew planned missions. For example, if VP had an operation going on somewhere. We always kept close to the CIA types who moved on the ground with the guerrilla forces. One day I spotted an ambush just before one of those patrols stumbled onto it. The only fighter I could find to help was a Laredo FAC, a single F4E with an internally mounted 20 millimeter gun. Unlike this picture, which is the only one I could find, he didn't carry bombs because he was a forward air controller. He just carried rockets and his gun. Since the bad guys were in spider holes down in the ground, he rolled in on a very high angle of attack, got rather close, and cut loose. Then he swapped ends, pulling a bunch of G's with both burners roaring, and the aircraft pancaked over the ridge line and into the valley. He pulled out just above the trees and climbed back to the clouds. Finally, he regained his voice <laughs> and said, fairly higher than I'm going to do it, Ah, Raven, I think I'm a bit heavy from the tanker. I'll climb up a bit higher this time. Now, that kind of pass gives a whole new meaning to the term poopy suit. <laughs> On April 23rd, barely a week after my baptism by fire, another new Raven arrived by the name of Dave Reese. He was scheduled to replace Jim Cross, who was within a few weeks of going home. Jim was a very sharp officer who had worked as a Senate page. He planned a career in politics and already had an impressive network set up. Dave Reese had come, like all the others, from a tour in Vietnam. He was a very likable guy who seemed to fit right in. I don't recall what we did the day he arrived, but it probably involved touring the local bars and clubs in Vientiane. On the morning of April 24, 1970, we all met at the table at our house in Vientiane, and each person said what he intended to do that day. I remember sitting across from Dave Reese now the new guy, but I don't remember the conversation. We headed out to the airport and I flew to some area that I've long since forgotten. Around lunchtime, Jim and Dave landed the U-17 after directing some airstrikes, grabbed a bite to eat and took off again all while I was airborne. I was about to land when I heard a call from Mark Diebold who was flying the AT-28 and who was talking to Jim Cross, but I could only hear one side of the conversation. Jim and Dave had unwittingly flown over Roadrunner Lake, which recently had been surrounded with heavy-duty 37-millimeter anti-aircraft guns as well as ZPU 23-4s machine guns and on towards Ban Ban. 
This is the 37 millimeter. Somewhere around there, the U-17 took three hits of anti-aircraft fire. Jim pointed the aircraft south and sought to put some uh, healthy distance between themselves and the big guns. Mark Diebold intercepted him at the southern edge of the PDJ and saw the aircraft below him in a steady descent. Jim said he jettisoned the ordnance and was hoping to clear the ridge line in front of him. Mark looked down and actually saw the trees of the jungle through the hole in the wing. A cloud moved between them, and when Mark cleared the cloud, he saw smoke and fire rising from just short of the ridge line. Only the AT-28 carried a parachute, so bailing out was not an option. We were unable to recover the bodies. Eighteen months ago, while I was still the Assistant Secretary of the Air Force, a member of my staff brought a message to me that the POW MIA folks from the POW MIA folks in San Antonio. They wanted me to know that they had recovered some bone fragments that had been positively identified as coming from Jim Cross and Dave Reese. I was in a state of shock, and at the same time, extreme joy. Actually, there were three groups of remains, one from Jim, one from Dave, and one that definitely came from the wreckage but could not be positively identified. In October, I flew to Ohio, Youngstown, where I had the honor of presenting the flag to Jim's father, along with fellow Raven Ron Reinhardt. Then last spring, I participated in the burial of Dave Reese, as well as the burial of the common fragments at Arlington National Cemetery. Members of both families attended, united now as they were on the, on the day that the news was given to them 39 years earlier. Several Ravens attended as well. It was an emotional time for all of us. Much of what we did was a cat and mouse game with the NVA. They were extremely good at camouflage, but it was hard for them to cover every track. Sometimes they simply pulled out a truck, pulled a truck or a tank up under a large tree and got away from it in case we saw it. My specialty was finding people. I could spot soldiers through a triple canopy jungle and the technique was simple. I flew high and used my binoculars to sweep the trails. One day I saw something out of place. A light spot moving across the PDJ. When I studied it more closely, but still careful to keep my distance so as not to alert them, I, uh, I saw a column of about a dozen soldiers, each of whom had cut a large palm leaf and had placed it over his head as he walked. That way he increased his camouflage and kept the hot sun off of his head at the same time. There was one problem. One of the soldiers gave them all away because he reversed the leaf and had it bottom side up. The top of the leaf is dark green, while the bottom is very light green. It was like waving a flag at me. I called up the fighters, and we did what we needed to do. This gives you an idea of what it looks like uh, when you come down, when you uh, would come out in the morning and you'd see the tracks of the, of the vehicles, and sometimes they'd just find the nearest tree and park it under there and put some grass over it. So you just follow the trail, you know, to the end. and. and when you had a chance, you, you blew it up, and lo and behold, something might be down there. By the mid-February uh, 1971, the NVA had pushed it within a few miles of the gorilla base at Long Chen. For several nights, they had rocketed us. It had come so often that once we heard the sound of the rockets flying overhead, we would automatically roll under our cots before the warhead would explode, and before we'd even wake up. On the morning before St. Valentine's Day, this is 1971, we took several rockets in the valley, but none dropped near our compound. I recall driving down to the hospital with our flight surgeon, Dr. Venedik Ossetinsky, and this is one of the few um, pictures I could find with uh, the doctor in it. Uh, he later on commanded the Wilford Hall Hospital in San Antonio and the Wiesbaden Hospital. We visited a rather portly Thai captain who was lying on his back on a table displaying a nasty hole in his left cheek. It went completely through the flesh into his mouth. I recall being surprised by the fact that there was virtually no blood around the wound. As a direct result of that attack, several of the U.S. maintenance types um, assessed our defensive posture and came to the conclusion that we did not have any real protection from, the from an attack. 
So they set out to build a bunker using anything they could get their hands on. They used a lot of sandbags for the foundation and covered them with corrugated aluminum and finally with more sand. For the, the, in, the intention was to have only one entrance with a zigzag entrance in a typical bunker thing. Uh, going to the main part of the bunker, but you could only do so much in one day. And we ended up with an opening at each end. The bunker was located between the wooden house, which served as our headquarters, and the two-story uh, concrete block building that housed our bedrooms and latrines. We went to bed that night with our weapons close at hand. As usual, the 105, field, 105 millimeter field piece, which had been set up near the King's house, north of the runway, south of the runway, I beg your pardon, kept up a steady fire of harassment and interdiction fire all, all night long. For you purists, no, this is not a 105 millimeter field piece, this is a howitzer. I know it's the only picture I could find. Gives you an idea though. We estimated the gun would fire around towards the areas where we thought the NVA troops were working at a rate of about once a minute. Try sleeping through that. At about 3 a.m., I woke up completely after hearing a change in sound. I realized the big gun was silent, but there were other explosions going off every few seconds, accompanied by small arms and automatic weapons fire. I stuck my head out the window and craned it to the right. I saw the flashes from the muzzles of numerous weapons and the flash of explosions. My immediate uh, thought was that our forces were engaged in some type of minor skirmish with a patrol of bad guys who might have tried to sneak into our valley. I didn't really feel threatened. I reached for my movie camera with the hopes of getting some, the fight, you know, some of the fight on film, even though it was dark. I tried to take a shot but discovered I was out of film. Okay, the fire's coming off this hillside, and later on it'll come into this compound. This is where we lived. So right now the battle's going on up here on this hill. I fumbled with a camera, and I heard a voice yell, incoming. I went for the floor under my bed just as a rather large artillery round hit the side of the building we were sleeping in. I jumped up, grabbed my M16 and pistol belt, and dashed out of the room and into a herd of people. Americans and locals, all of whom were running down the stairs towards the new bunker. We piled into the bunker as the rounds impacted the, the ground and the buildings around us. While we huddled there, I had the opportunity to count the rounds coming in and noticed that we felt or heard an explosion every six seconds. That was to keep up at a rather steady rate for the next two to three hours until it got light. I found out later the NVA unit had worked its way around to the south of Long Chen and attacked the men who were firing the 105 millimeter field piece. The friendlies were totally surprised but put up a short fight. This is, the, uh, the NVA carried six guns, a mixture of 61 millimeter mortars and this a DK-82 recoilless rifle. We were able to count the guns by observing the muzzle flashes. This is a 61 millimeter mortar. Once the friendlies were driven away from the 105 millimeter gun, the NVA just turned their guns toward us and began firing directly into our compound. What I had seen on the hillside just outside my window was this firefight. Our biggest fear was that the NVA would capture the 105 millimeter gun intact and use it against us. If that had happened, I would not be here today. It's just that simple. Fortunately, one of the local soldiers tossed a thermite grenade down the barrel of the gun just before he made a run for it. I'll never know his name, but I honor his memory all the same. The firing continued, but we knew we were blind if all of us stayed in that bunker. So a few of the guys made a run for the two-story barracks and took up observation positions in some of the bedrooms. One of the ravens took the first shift in the docks room, which is a somewhat larger corner bedroom, while our intel officer Mike, I won't give his last name because you might know him. We called him Fat Albert. He was a little overweight. So. <laughs> Fat Albert uh, stood guard by the latrine window. Our only weapons at this point were M16s, AK-47, sidearms, and hand grenades. Beyond our, our building was a, a bunch of concertina wire, and then there was the village. The whole area sloped away from us until you came to the bottom of a valley, which was less than a mile away. And then the real valley wall covered with trees, shrubs, and grass began its climb up to about a thousand feet. The enemy force was hidden on the hillside about a mile or a little more away. 
The really bad news was that they had occupied what we considered to be the only reasonable escape route out of the valley. We had radio contact with a blockhouse, a house of solid rock which was located at the end of the, camp, uh, the compound off to our left. I believe they had a 30 millimeter machine gun set up over there, but it wasn't much good at that range. We also had a 50 cal machine gun set up in the corner of the compound to our right, and he was able to return fire towards the muzzle flashes. We were all terrified, all of us, and we came to the real realization we were probably not going to make it out of there. I recall very vividly the feeling of absolute panic and the almost uncontrollable urge to throw down my M16 and simply run. It was a great personal struggle. I was just it was just becoming light outside, but still pitch black in the bunker. Alone with my thoughts, I had time to evaluate what was happening, and I became convinced that I would not make it out. The incredible, indescribable fear started in the pit of my stomach and rose to spread throughout my body, much like the first pangs of nausea when you feel when you know you've caught the flu and you know you're about to throw up. Your flesh is clammy, your, the sweat pours profusely off your forehead. The temptation to run was overwhelming, even though I had no plan and no place to go. The reason I did not run was I could not leave my buddies. The bonding that had taken place over the previous torturous months was the glue that kept me in my place. A few minutes later, the urge passed and I was again in control. It is the most awful feeling I've ever felt and it changed me forever. Apparently the guys in the blockhouse were able to get off an SOS message to Alley Cat, the nighttime airborne command post, but the only help they could uh, send us was a Laos and AC-47, who, uh, I have a word here but I won't use it, sort of frittered away his load of uh, 7.62 uh, bullets in the hills a couple of miles from the target, in spite of continuous attempts to get him to move to the right area. He was worthless. All most of those guys cared about was shooting up all their ammo so they could sell the brass. A few minutes later, we heard an AT-28 start up on the ramp. Then, to our amazement, he took off in the pitch black night, this is a VFR airplane, into a sky filled with invisible mountains and actually bombed the enemy position, VFR, at night. Then he headed south towards Vientiane as he had no hope of landing back at Lima 20 alternate. Later on, the only Laotian O-1, which for some reason had spent the night there at the 20 alternate, took off and departed south. We discovered later that it carried General Vang Pao. It may not surprise you to learn that a couple of humorous events took place while we were waiting for the end. The first occurred just after we'd taken refuge in the bunker and were doing a lot of collective shaking. Apparently, one of the other Americans in camp had been caught outside during the attacks and been cut in the leg, but not too seriously, by shrapnel. He managed to make his way to the blockhouse, and it wasn't long before a guy named Burr, one of the CIA guys, called us in a rather excited state on the radio demanding to know where the dock was. Our guy manning the radio asked, in total darkness now, is the dock here? Yeah, was the reply out of the dark. Uh, the response was, well, tell him Shep's hurt. He's got a cut on the leg. Remember now, the rounds were impacting about every six seconds all around us. The guy on the radio swung his flashlight around until it fell on the dock, the one you saw earlier. So what the hell am I supposed to do about it? Was the short, there was the short, squat, gray-haired, kindly Dr. Ossetinsky, specialist in intestinal surgery, six-year time and grade full colonel, armed to the teeth with his M16 across his knees, a bandolier of ammo across his zipped-up flak vest and a helmet on his head, not a Band-Aid in sight. <laughs> the terror of the moment passed and we doubled up with laughter. At another time, Mike, alias Fat Albert, was crouching below the latrine window when a round slammed into the side of the building. Mike was a large man. The impact threw him off balance and hurtled him into the toilet. <laughs> Later on, he proudly displayed his only official war wound, a very bruised shin, which had unceremoniously come in contact with the toilet bowl. As the first hint of dawn crept through the hills, a flight of F-4s, killer flight, rendezvoused overhead. I'll have to admit that the air was very smoky and visibility was poor, but there's still no excuse for what was about to take place. Chad, and I only put Chad in here, he's got his dog with him, I realize. Uh, I was a senior ranking Raven, so Chad Swedberg and I made a dash from door to door until we reached the docks room. 
There we tried making contact with the flight by using our FM radio via a patch through Alicat on their UHF radios, but it didn't work. We solved the problem by making contact on backup 2828, which is the backup uh, rescue frequency, and everything else was fine. I told Chad to talk on the radio while I backed him up. The lead aircraft was loaded with CBU-24 and 42. 42 is time-delayed fusing. Uh, it runs for about 30 minutes, up to 30 minutes they go off. So the book says. Well, number two had wall-to-wall -wall Mark 82s, which were 500-pound bombs. We carefully described the village, uh, the target, which was on the hillside, in the trees, and the friendly position in the valley, in the village. Pretty easy, right? When they were ready, we marked the target using the tracers from the 50 cal machine gun. They said they were in. Actually, Lead made the first pass, but didn't release any ordnance. At this point, I had a bad feeling about this whole situation. And I said to Chad, move them out a mile away from the whole area and have one of them drop one or two bombs on the hilltop and then work them in. I just don't trust the F-4s. These were the iron-sided uh, Ds. Uh, so that's exactly what Chad did. Sure enough, number two dropped a couple of bombs nearly a mile from where we had thought. We called for the 50 cal machine gun again and Lead rolled in. He kept asking for clearance and we repeated that we couldn't see him on his pass. So if he had everything in sight and understood everything, then he was cleared in hot. Disaster. He decided to drop all six canisters of CBU on one pass. Unfortunately, he dropped it directly on us. I recall very clearly looking out the open window and seeing the trees and the houses in the village exploding into bits and a solid wall of destruction racing towards us like a tidal wave. Chad was screaming on the radio, you're dropping on the friendlies, you're dropping on the friendlies, and I made a reference to his ancestry then jumped under the only bed that was in the room and was immediately crushed by four other bodies. The wall of destruction raced through the compound and tore most of the roof off the building. The bunker took two or three direct hits and the operations center on the far side of the bunker caught fire. We raced back to the bunker and hung on for dear life. The building next door continued to burn as did the dining hall and the little bar over the bear cage. We knew that the building had several tanks of bottled gas near our position, but luckily the safety valves worked as advertised, releasing their gas one at a time in a loud hiss, and the tanks did not blow up. Then the smoke began filling our little bunker, but once again our prayers were answered and the fire in the operations building burned itself out. Many other nearby buildings, the dining hall, the CIA dorm, the bar above the bear cage, like I mentioned, burned to the ground. The reason we couldn't leave our shelter was because hundreds of the CBU bomblets with time-delayed fuses were lying all around and going off for up to an hour and a half, not 30 minutes, after the incident. Shep, the guy with the cut leg, happened to be outside with a group of six Hmong when he heard the F-4 make the fatal pass. He looked up in time to see the clamshells, the dispensers, open above him and he hit the ground. When he stood up to run for it, he was the only one left. After an hour, the U.S. Army liaison officer, who happened to be visiting at that time, uh, decided to make a run for one of the other buildings. He had just stepped out the entrance when one of the bomblets went off in his face. I thought, good God, he's gone. But he came back inside, shaking, and said that as soon as he had stepped outside, he saw the CBU, and instantaneously it, he saw it blow up. Fortunately, it split down the seam to two pieces and he emerged unscathed. We found out later CBU tends to do this. As daylight filled the sky, the NVA pulled back and disappeared into the jungle. We uh, later discovered several NVA bodies near the perimeter fence. They were members of a sapper team who were within a few minutes of entering the compound and finishing us off when the CBU from the misguided F4 wiped them out too. Another stroke of heavenly intervention. As soon as we could, we ran to the flight line to inspect our airplanes. By this time, Chuck Engel had arrived on scene in his 01 after flying up from Vientiane and began directing airstrikes. Each of us examined his aircraft, if it was safe to fly, threw one of the support guys in the back seat and took off. 
I ended up with Fat Albert in my rear seat, and we strained our way into the sky. <laughs> and because I was the last Raven Airborne, I was stuck with directing a continuous string of airstrikes, which by this time were coming in waves before I could head south. Mike simply got airsick and threw up all over the airplane. What a day. Uvali was a Hmong backseater. He had a chubby face that radiated enthusiasm for his work. He was courageous, intelligent, spoke English quite well. One day he rode in the back seat with another raven, whose name I will not mention, and they flew over an area just south and east of the PDJ. The raven saw NVA soldiers on the ground quite clearly, especially one group that appeared to be assembling a weapon. The raven thought it was a DK-82 recoilless rifle. And rather than use his binoculars, he decided to make a low pass over them just to make sure. He was wrong. The soldiers were in the final process of setting up a 51 cal anti-aircraft machine gun. Now this particular 01 had been hit the week before by AK-47 fire while the chief raven Bob Foster was flying it. The result had been five bullet holes in and five bullet holes coming out. But bullets tumble when they strike something solid, and so the exit holes reflected the length of the bullet rather than the diameter. The ten bullet holes had been covered with some speed tape, like, sort of like duct tape, and uh, it was still good enough to fly. In any case, the gunners cut loose with a heavy machine gun and struck the bird dog with five rounds. Four of the six rounds passed harmlessly through the near porous aircraft, while the fifth round came up through first the floor uh, and the, then the radios, and then through the rear seat, striking Uva Lee in the buttocks and exiting out his chest. There was blood and gore everywhere in the cockpit, and Uva Lee was killed instantly. The Raven tried to contact the folks at Lima 20 alternate, but the radio was knocked out. It took him over 30 minutes to fly home, and during that time, Cricket noticed that he had, was overdue for his 50 minute, 15 minute check in call and called for a search and rescue. And so we raced out to the area expecting to find wreckage. But he appeared over the horizon at the last minute and landed. Uva Lee's body was removed from the aircraft and the crew chiefs attempted to wash it out with a bucket of soap and water. Uva Lee had been born and raised near Nong Het in the eastern PDJ. And while still a boy, the communists had attacked his village and his father was killed. This left Uva Lee the only surviving male member of his family and left him with the responsibility to provide for his mother and his sisters. He grew up quickly and entered Vang Pao's army. Eventually, his ambition was recognized and he was sent to English training and became a robin backseater. Now he was making good money, but he aspired to become a chopper cow, a Hmong T-28 pilot. That night, several of us commandeered a jeep and drove to his mother's grass hut out on the village. We could hear the wailing from quite a distance. I remember stepping into the light of the interior, and this is what I saw. Uvali was dressed in a plain black suit. All Hmong men seemed to own a plain black suit for special occasions. And he was stretched out with his hands to his side on a plank of wood with his head elevated slightly. Everyone was absolutely stoic, except for his, including his sisters. No hint of expression showed on their faces. Now his mother, however, indulged in incessant wailing, and the sound could be heard for a long distance. At his side, the shaman or witch doctor mumbled continuously and shook bones in his hand and threw them on the ground. Then he would scoop them up, throw them on the ground again and again for as long as we were there. We stood quietly, reverently, until it was time to go. Then we summoned a trusted agent, emptied our wallets of all the kip, that's the local currency, that we had and asked that the money be given to Uvali's mother. We stepped back into the darkness and drove back to our hooch. The funeral was scheduled for the next day and we all planned to attend. Imagine my surprise when I was told that I could not attend the funeral, but uh, I was scheduled to take the crippled aircraft back to Udarn for major repair work. One radio had been hotwired so that I could talk to the tower and that was that. I was extremely angry, but my objections were ignored. I pre-flighted the airplane and saw that fresh speed tape had been applied to the 20 holes of the skin of the 01. 
When I opened the door, I saw that the blood stains of my friend had not been removed, nor had the huge hole in the seat been covered. At this point, I was extremely emotional and climbed into the front seat of the, in abject silence. I added power to the engine and released the brakes. Then I lifted off from the runway and flew over the funeral procession as it wound its way to the funeral pyre off the end of the runway. It was just like a movie. I climbed and flew the next hour or more to Udorn, entered the pattern for landing. I called Det 1 and told them I was bringing in a combat damaged 01 for repair. They directed me to the parking area. I taxied in but saw no crew chief waiting as I had expected there would be. So I taxied up in front of the hangar, shut down the engine, pulled on the parking brake, stepped out, and walked away from the despised aircraft. As I did, a crew chief came running out of the hangar, repeatedly apologizing for not meeting me as he'd not been told that I was coming in. I took no notice and ignored his sincere apology, still angry at what I had been forced to do. I distinctly heard the sound of his racing feet on the tarmac, which came to a screeching halt a short distance behind me. Then, I saw the, then he saw the aircraft, with speed tape all blown off, revealing 20 small and large holes, plus a horribly blood-stained interior with a gaping hole in the rear seat. All he said was a slow and measured, oh my God. I never broke stride and continued to the officers club. We're getting a, I actually had a little more I wanted to tell you, but I think what I'll do is I'm going to skip this part and uh, just take a couple of questions and I've got the closing comments. If you have any. Or I can go on and cover them. It's a little hard for me to see. Yes, please. Not really, no, not, not, not really. We figured they were listening to us. So they, no, they, they didn't have any jamming uh, equipment up there that I ever heard of. Yes, please. Isn't a lot of missions uh, or allow, and the F-4 didn't miss the target. But, uh, <laughs> well, one of the things I'm leaving out is probably the most fabulous mission, which was an F-4. <laughs> Glad to meet you. We worked with Vang Pao. We, uh, we worked with the government. It was, uh, the program was started year, a couple of years before. They called the Butterfly Program. It was tied to the Air America Program. It was tied to the CIA. And what they had was uh, uh, enlisted guys from the Special Operations Wing down at Herbert would go up in the, in the back end of those porters and through an interpreter find the targets and they're kneeling down here in the back because they have no seats. And they'd find a place they'd take a smoke grenade and pop it out the window. When uh, General uh, Momar took over and decided to introduce his, his F-4s in there, he says, I am not having my jet aircraft directed by enlisted guys. He says, I want fully qualified facts or fighter pilots. So we used to have a mixture of the two, but by far overwhelming number were former facts. And he says, I want it done, da -da 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 -da. and he got it. And the Raven program was born. And we took over from the butterflies then. And there were only a handful of those guys, too. But uh, yeah, you could go up. Anything that was open, like the trail, we didn't mess with the trail. That was not our territory. We had guys coming in from Vietnam, you know, the other O2s and what have you, the Coveys and uh, you know, all kinds of folks. It, it, it was just the difference in the mission. If you had to do troops in contact, you had to know who the people were on the ground, what they were trying to do. You couldn't figure out who was good and who was bad. So th that was the mission we had. Yes, please. It was interesting. In 66, I was one of the nail or gombies that went up into uh, 20 alternate and places like that. Uh, we had an arrangement on our planes where you could slide the insignia out of the folder. Yeah. I noticed your pictures always showed it blank. Yeah, there were a couple of those left. I just don't have any pictures of them, but other than the Ravens do. And uh, yeah, they just had a little thing and they could put in the, the nationality of the day if they needed to. 
But we didn't do that. We, just, we were just totally unmarked. So we never did that. Is there a I was told uh, that if you flew under another nation's insignia, that was a bad thing. I suspect it probably was. We didn't do it. If other people used those airplanes earlier on or what they used them for, I don't know. I never saw that happen. I, never, I did see some that were given to the Laotians and they just put the Laotian thing in there. But they were Laotians flying them. Or Hmong, they were in the Laotian army as well. <laughs> sir. Uh, yes, sir, what was your average altitude and uh, did you use rockets to mark your target? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely, rockets. Um, I, I knew that the AK-47 shot up to uh, 1,500 feet, max effective range. AK-47s, I always, always stayed at 1,500 feet. Other guys did not. Uh, if I thought that was a 51 cal, I was at 3,000. If it was a uh, ZPU, I was at 4,500. It was a 37 millimeter. You can get to 6,000 feet in this airplane and put an airstrike in on a 37 millimeter. And I'll tell you what, a 37 millimeter and an 01, that's an uneven match. <laughs> they tend to win. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll hang around later to in case there's some other questions. Uh, I was one of the uh, first Ravens up there, and I agree with you. We kept uh, our insignia back under the seat pad. We never used them. Yeah. We had three that were, you know, came with the airplane, but we never used them. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually skip forward here because I see we're getting a little late on, on, on time here. And I want to get you out at 9. I've talked about the uh, operations of the, of the Ravens and presented a few stories. And I'm going to have to probably step through some slides here too, so bear with me if it takes a second to get caught up. I believe we uh, need to delve a bit further into the common experience of the Ravens and indeed of other men who were deeply involved in hard combat for an extended period of time. No one who encounters war at a young and impressionable age can remain unchanged by his experiences. Under the strain of deep emotional stress, the very fiber of one's being is assaulted. His strengths are uh, attacked and his weaknesses exploited until what comes out the other side is often barely recognizable, even to those who are closest to him. Will he emerge strong as a sword that was crafted in fire and water, or will he snap like a cornstalk in a strong wind? I use my own experience as an example. I wanted to get to Southeast Asia. I wanted to get the, where the action was. While in Vietnam, I found the action to be too widely spaced and the bureaucracy too smothered to be able to stretch my wings and, and, and grow. It was the main reason I chose uh, to volunteer for the Ravens. As the, the thrill of the unknown was far better than the stifling monotony of, of the known. During the first four months of flying in Laos, I worked hard, very hard. I saw friends die, Americans, Lao, and Hmong. And when each one left, he took a piece of my soul, which I was happy to give. By the time I headed home for the 30 days leave in that August of 1970, I felt thin and stretched. I wanted to go home, but my constant thought was always of them back over there. Because of the classification of the program, I could not talk about the things that I wanted to talk about. So I tried to make do with discussions about babies, beer, and cars. I couldn't wait to return to the war. When I did, the rainy season gave way uh, to sunny days followed by the onslaught of the dry season and the inevitable annual offenses, if offensive by the North Vietnamese Army. And there were still more losses. Sisai shot himself down with his own strafe after ignoring the warnings of the raven unseen. I'm sorry I had to skip Chuck Engel, who's one of your local people here, but I'll, I just don't have time. His story's in the book. That picture's in the book. Frenchy, practicing his instrument flying, which few Lao pilots were proficient in, flew into a cloud and a mountain with his head down in the cockpit. Uvali's funeral. Grant Ewells. Well, there was a day when Grant Ewells flew into a known hostile area thinking it there was a 12.7 millimeter machine gun and it was the only threat, only to find that a 14.5 ZPU had been moved in overnight. 
His last words to us were, I can't get away from this thing. Another raven saw his aircraft making lazy descending circles trailing smoke until he hit the ground and exploded in fire. My close friend, Park Bunker, who had followed me from my little farming village in uh, Duqua, and his backseater were shot down a few days before Christmas and less than a month before he was to return home. He was an extremely pain, it was an extremely painful loss since he was talking to another raven by radio as the NVA soldiers fired constantly at him. He tried to surrender, but in the Plain de Jars, the hated ravens were never taken alive. At the end, he calmly radioed, I've been hit five times, I'm as good as dead. They dragged his body back to the plane and propped it up against the wheel which they, while they set up a trap for the rescue forces. Eventually, his body disappeared and was never recovered. We were very, very close. Jim Hicks was shot down in our last AT-28, but was picked up by Air America. Frank Burke, the taller guy there, flew a mission where he was hit 43 times by ground fire, but flew his bird dog back to a safe landing in spite of the fact he had no radios, that the fire extinguisher had blown up in the backseater's face, and an explosion in the fuel tank ripped one of the wings three inches outside of, out of the fuselage. Then there was Hank Allen, who I talked about before, and Dick Elzinka. Then there was Jim Cross and Dave Reese. As my own tour of 19 months approached the end, and as the air filled with smoke from the burning fields and obscured our vision, I began to fly higher and higher. We, were, we all knew that pilots were lost when they first arrived in country or shortly before they were scheduled to leave. Fear, stress, exhaustion were now building faster than my body and mind could recover from them. To give you an idea how much flying we did, my logbook clearly shows that I flew 100 hours of hard combat time in 12 and a half days during this period. I carried eight white phosphorus marking rockets and often I had eight sets of fighters stacked up waiting to be directed on an airstrike. I'd get everybody on one frequency and give one briefing for all, whatever, 32, 25, 32 aircraft. I closed with the instructions that I would give each flight one marking round and the rest of the strike would be directed from the smoke of the bombs by the guy in front of them, dropped by the guy in front of them. The trivial details of life gave way to the daily experience of life versus death. The weight of responsibility was as much as you could bear and more than any man can bear alone. The bonds cemented in those days were made of stainless steel. Out of the depths of war came incredible clarity of vision. This vision and the sense that we were absolutely at the peak of our game gave us a feeling of self-actualization that only those who have experienced it will ever know. Possibly the most traumatic loss occurred a couple of weeks before I left. Chuck Engel, who was from right across the border here near Winchester in Indiana, was scheduled to leave a few days before I was. By the way, uh, Chuck, I watched him earn the Air Force Cross and a Silver Star. Both of us had been brought out of Long Chen to Vientiane for a period of readjustment to allow us to buy our stereo gear before we departed. Uh, Chuck and Tom King caught an Air America flight up to Lima 20 alternate in order to ferry a couple of bird dogs back south for scheduled maintenance. On the way, they decided to rat race a bit. Chuck ended up in a very compromised position with Tom parked at his 6 o'clock. And I executed a split S maneuver, something none of us had the guts to do in 01. Unfortunately, he was too low and struck a stand of bamboo just as he was pulling out. The aircraft went in and burned. At the same time, I had driven out to the airport to Vientiane to meet Chuck and to go over some awards and decorations write-ups with him. I was the unit awards and decks officer for Long Chen. I sat on the ramp in the open jeep and waited and waited and waited. Finally, someone came out of the operations building and told me what had just happened. I asked if Chuck had made it okay and was told he had burned in the wreckage. I was in total shock. I walked in a daze across the flight line and stumbled against a revetment. Then in the privacy of my thoughts and the obscurity of the flight line, I fell over and I cried. 
And I cried, and I cried until there were no more tears to shed. As I pulled myself up, I knew I would never feel a loss like that again. And so I promised myself on the spot that I would never cry like that again for the rest of my life. I never have. I asked to be allowed to accompany the, uh, the body home, but that request was denied. They were still concerned about keeping the program a secret, so a stranger laid my friend to rest in a cemetery in Winchester, Indiana, next to his dad. That's less than a 90-minute drive from here. I remember the flight home, the final flight, right, the Freedom Bird. Specifically, I recall sitting in the seat, totally oblivious to who was near me and thinking deep thoughts. Inevitably, I asked myself the question that every soldier, every airman, sailor, and marine asks himself when he leaves the battlefield. Why me? Why am I still alive and they are not? There is no answer to that question, and the question does not go away with time. When I returned home, I had a foul mouth and an uncomfortable urge, uncontrollable urge, to drop to the floor whenever there was a sudden loud sound. I kept to myself a lot and couldn't wait to get to my next assignment where I could be with people who understood me. One night, my troubled mind played a nasty trick on me. In a dream, in a dream, I was with all my friends, including those who had died. We laughed together as we as they explained that it was all just a big mistake. We partied again, as we had in the past, fueled by exhaustion and the feeling of absolute camaraderie. Abruptly, the dream ended. I opened my eyes in the dark room. Tears ran down my cheeks as I sobbed in my pillow. This picture was taken a couple of weeks after I returned to the United States. I had lost 20 pounds. I wasn't sleeping well. I was sullen, suspicious, and angry. I wanted to be with my friends or left alone. But I had no idea that it showed the way it did. Six months later, this picture was taken. I was back to normal. I want to close with a poem. At one of the Raven reunions, the following poem was given to Craig Morrison, the former president of the Edgar Allan Poe Society. The verse was written by Art Cornelius after the death of his friend Sam Dykelman. Sam, like so many others, simply disappeared one day. In the poem, there is a reference to an earlier incident where Sam was shot down and his backseater was killed. Unashamedly emotional and written immediately after the loss, the knowledge that it is not the work of a poet, but a heartfelt tribute to a warrior, of a warrior to a fallen comrade, gives its words a poignant authenticity. It is now a ritual reading at Raven reunions. In the memory, in my memory, I carry the twinkle of your eye, the delight of your laugh, and the courage that was life as we expected every day to die. The red mud stuck to our boots and tires and dust to our bodies and silver wraiths of mist swirled over and around green mountains. Smaller men stood taller and larger than our size. But you towered over us all, your grin, your tears. Every orphan was your child, every life a part of yours. When Chow held on to the thread of life, you'd have bled for him breathed for him. You'd have given your life for him if you could. We lived each day in fire and air. And every dawn, life's croupier spun the wheel again. And I'd have been a better friend, but I trusted time. There never was a man more strong, more peaceful, more fierce, more fair. And we are all proud to love you. Perhaps one day, when the fire is out, green mountains will show a flash of gold. I'll see the twinkle of your eye and smile again. 
I want you to know, being very honest, that when I die, I want three important things to take place. The first is, I hope that God will smile on me. For like the title character in Saving Private Lion, Private Ryan, as he walks through the cemetery with his wife, I have tried to live a good life. Second, I want to have my wife by my side, for I will never love another one, another person, as much as I do here, her. Finally, as human vision fades, I want to focus on my friends from Laos. Young, strong, happy, and whole as I remember them. Only then will I raise my head one last time and laugh out loud, for I shall have lived. Thank you for allowing me to be here with you this evening and to merge our hearts for a few precious moments. May God bless America. People get away, Craig, my friend. Uh, the, the bombs weren't the only thing that were stainless steel. Courage of your group was stainless. And to, um, because of your friends and your compadres, uh, paraphrase uh, Edgar Allan Poe, who said, nevermore. Uh, let me change that to evermore to you as a memento of the evening. Thank you very much, John. <laughs> okay. I'll just set this up here for right now. Oh, bless her. Well done. that just loves to. Yeah, I'm gonna come down. I used to be able to just jump down. I'm not gonna do oh, that. Here, here we go. Here. We're hooked on something. There we go. No, it wasn't going so immediately. <laughs> so.